Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. We are going to do a Lori Vallow crash course because I put out a video earlier today. I've had a lot of emails, inboxes, everywhere you can imagine saying, hey, I want to cover this case or I want to follow this case after Murdoch. We had a lot of first timers on Murdoch who are hooked now at the whole process. But the mega series is 50 something episodes and they're like, yeah, I'll get to it. But like, I can't get to it before April 3rd. So I put a video out asking everybody to give their opinion. Do you want a crash course? Just what you need to know to understand the trial. There was a resounding yes with a handful of no. So we are going to do it and we're going to get you guys ready for this trial. It's going to take all week, but by the time that rolls around, you'll be ready. As far as covering Vallow Daybell, here's my plan. I will be going up for Law and Crime and the podcast. I will be there for jury selection openings the first two weeks of testimony. I will come home for a week, back for two, home for a week, and so on. And I'm really looking forward to it. This case is what me and Fruit Loop, my old co-host, started this podcast on. This is very full circle for me to sit in that courtroom with her. And I've grown to love uh, Kay and Larry so much and Kresha and the members of that family. And, uh, they are going to need some support up there to hug their necks on days where it's just a little tough. And I will be bringing you the daily recaps every night. I will likely be able to get the audio. So the summaries could be a day late for when I'm here at home. Nonetheless, you guys are not going to miss a minute. I will try to incorporate some graphics to make it a little more interesting, but we will not have a live audio feed to watch. It is what it is. There's time to change Judge Boyce's mind. So we will see what happens with that. First off, want a big, big, big thank you again to Harry from Alaska. Uh, your generosity touched my heart. Thank you so much, sir. Also, big thank you to Brady, em Emily, Dorinda. Dorinda, Neathal, I think it's a cool name, and Carolyn. Music fact of the day, Leonard Skinner. You know, when the plane took off from Greenville after they finished their show, that was the night the plane crashed. But in one of the oddest pairings since Jimi Hendrix opened up for the Monkees, yes, the Monkees, Leonard Skinner played four shows in Germany with the band Queen back in 1971. Apparently, groups did not get along. I could see that happening. I love me some Freddie Mercury, though, y'all. Come on. All right. So what are we going to do? What is Lori charged with right now out of the gate? Because her and Chad are severed. Chad has no court date in sight. And had Lori not chosen to go ahead with her speedy trial, I fully feel like we would not be having one next month because Judge Boyce agreed, as did Lori's attorney, by the way, that if she had waived her right to a speedy trial, he also would have asked for extra time to examine this DNA that has come to light, which is a hair found at the crime scene, I believe in duct tape, and that stuff has got to be examined. I was just on the STS podcast with Lori Hellis. Her theory is that that could be thrown out at Lori's trial and just not admitted because there's not enough evidence for the or enough time for them to look through it, have it tested if they wanted, et cetera. But what's Lori charged with? Well, a lot. She's charged with conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception for the death of her daughter, Tylee Ryan. First degree murder for the death of her daughter, Tylee Ryan. Conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and grand theft by deception for the death of J.J. Vallow, her adopted son, and first-degree murder for the death of J.J. Vallow. Conspiracy to commit first-degree murder in the death of Tammy Daybell, who is Chad Daybell's wife, and grand theft related to Social Security survivor benefits for the care of Tylee and J.J., that were used after the children went missing and were found deceased. And guess what? Not just Idaho. She's got some waiting in Arizona for Charles Vallow. 
conspiracy to commit first degree murder in his murder that was done at the hands of her now dead brother, Alec. Alec. I keep wanting to say Alec. Alex Cox. All right. So who's who? Let's go through Lori. All right. Lori had five husbands. We're only going to talk about three here. They're relevant. So her second marriage resulted in the birth of her oldest child and son, Colby Ryan. Her third marriage, Joe Ryan. Lori and Joe had Tylee. Husband number four, Charles Vallow. Dad to JJ. JJ Vallow, adopted son of Charles and Lori. So five husbands and we see with her, with everything, anything we have found has always been everybody's fault, not hers. And, um, you know, so here's who's dead at the hands of that woman, these beautiful souls. And I always count Joe Ryan in that, even though they ruled his death natural, if she didn't physically kill him, she killed his spirit by not allowing that man time with his daughter. She threw rocks in the road at every turn and in ways that will make a normal mother spit nails. What she subjected that child to, she should have been locked up long ago. All right. So now let's jump over to Chad and Tammy. So Tammy Daybell is the husband of was the husband of Chad Daybell. Chad is a doomsday author. He is a self-proclaimed thin veil traveler to the other side. I'm going to tell you how that happened here soon. He is accused of murdering his wife Tammy Daybell in her sleep on October 19th of 2019. Went to bed fine and did not wake up. Uh, she was relatively healthy from what we know, had been visiting family before. They had a great time dancing in the living room. She was a librarian and seemed like a sweet soul. All right. So Alex Cox, here is a, and I want to thank law and crime for allowing me to use this. So these are the deaths connected to the doomsday couple. Lori Vallow's Third husband, Charles, killed in what originally was declared self-defense, now murder. Their adopted son, JJ, found dead in Chad Daybell's backyard. Lori's biological daughter, Tylee Ryan, found dead in the same backyard as JJ, 30 feet apart in the pet cemetery, I might add. Lori's third husband, Joseph Ryan, Tylee's biological dad, dead Heart disease, natural, but she contributed. I'm sorry. That custody battle is nasty. We're going to touch on it a bit here. I do have in-depth episodes on that where I talk to Tom Ware, the Guardian ad litem for Tylee during the nasty years-long custody battle that began when Tylee was a very small, small baby and uh, continued really until Joe died in April of 2018. Who else is dead? Lori's brother, Alex Cox, who people refer to as the family hitman. It is sort of the running theory that maybe he killed everybody. I'm not so sure of that. With Chad, we have Tammy Daybell murdered October of 2019. She was a librarian. She loved animals. She loves ducks. Uh, was very well loved at her school. All right, the next person we're going to talk about, these are all your major players, Melan Melanie Pulowski. Now, you will hear me refer to her as Melanie. Why? Well, there's two Melanies in this case, and it gets very, very confusing trying to separate them both. She is Lori's niece. Lori's sister, Stacy, died years ago when Melanie was nine, and so... They got closer in the adult years around the time all this doomsday stuff started. But Melanie's married first to Brandon Boudreaux. They have four children together. Now, she divorced Brandon out of the blue. We will get into all this. I'm just giving you a little background. And kind of seemed to follow Lori's footsteps all the way to Rexburg, moved there without her kids. And met her second husband, Ian Pulowski. It was a very quick meeting and marriage. They now have one child together. So we have JJ and Tylee. 
who are cousins to Melanie's. Lori Vallow, she is the aunt of Melanie's. Alex Cox, the uncle. All right, so let's get into a lot of this. All right, so we got Melanie Gibb. She is a follower of Lori and Chad. She was in the middle in a lot of what happened. She's given interviews kind of downplaying her role, but it's there. The document dumps have shown us she was in the middle of things. I do not believe she had anything at all to do with the murder of the children and was really considered to be Lori's BFF. Zulima. She was the controller of the element. So if you tick her off, she might call up an earthquake and have the earth swallow you, or she might set a fire around you. She controlled the elements. She was definitely in this group. And before the group, she was a professional cuddler, y'all. You could pay her and she'd cuddle up with you. No, thank you. She was the wife of Alex Cox for 13 days before he was found dead by her son, on the bathroom floor. Coincidence, you'll never convince me of it. It was the day after Tammy Daybell's body was exhumed. And guess what? They realize it's all coming together for law enforcement. Our goose might be cooked. So let's talk about how did Chad get his gifts to be able to have one foot in the mortal world and one foot in the afterworld. We have to go back to 1985. When he was 17, he went cliff jumping and hit his head. He said he felt a pop in his head thinking, oh goodness, I've broken my neck. He said his body sunk deeper, but his spirit got stuck on something. So his body's floating back. Spirit's like, yo, I'm here. As his body resurfaced, his spirit popped back in his body. And after that day, he said he was a changed person. He devoured church-related books, scriptures, and the works of several authors, some of which were deemed to be controversial in the LDS faith. He said he had a strong impression he would need this information later in life, and he said when he hit the water, he thinks his personal veil was torn open and did not seal properly. So he became receptive to sensing spirits, feeling promptings, and impressions. He said this helped him still steer clear of people and situations that may have led him into trouble. Clearly, the spirits did not say, you're going to meet a blonde girl. Run. Run, buddy. Like Forrest Gump. Run. But he would see glimpses of his future. So he married Tammy Douglas Daybell in 1990. 1991. Lori graduates high school and marries her first husband. Honeymoon didn't last long. They filed for divorce not too long after marrying. They were still teenagers. A year later in 1992, Tra uh, Chad graduates from BYU. Lori moves from Rialto, California to Austin, Texas to begin cosmetology school. The next year, 1993, Chad has his Third, second death experience in La Jolla, California after being hit by a wave. He said when this happened, his spirit visited his deceased grandfather who showed him future events. This caused the veil that separated in the first fall of 95 to completely just bust wide open. The veil apparently separates the mortal life from the spirit world. And these two falls caused that veil to stay partially open. And he felt he had a foot in both worlds. Now, on screen here, you can see the little boo-boo he got on his back from this second veil-torn wide open incident. My kid and me, I've had bigger rashes on my back from, like, riding my skateboard down the hill. My shirt comes up as I'm falling. And, yeah, so, you big baby. All right, so 1995, Chad becomes the cemetery sexton in Springville, Utah. The same year, Lori marries again her second husband, who is the father of Colby Ryan. 1996, a year later, Lori's like, yeah, I'm done. Divorce is her second husband. 1997, Chad hears a voice in the cemetery who says, it's time to write your book, Chad. 
So a plot for an errand for Emma, which was his book, comes to mind. Now, in 1998, Lori's sister, Stacy Cope, dies. She leaves behind Lori's niece, Melanie. I call her Melanie's. Uh, very sad that she lost her mom at, at such a young age. There were some custody battles between Melanie's mom and dad. Ultimately, she lived with her dad, lived with her grandparents a bit, I believe. But she becomes involved with this crew down the road. We will get there. In 2001, ironically, Chad gives an interview about being a cemetery sexton and says, sad times are always when you have to bury babies. That's always a poignant moment. Well, it wasn't a poignant moment when he helped, allegedly helped bury two babies because 16, you know, and, and, and seven, that's a baby. Give me a break. The same year, Lori marries Joe Ryan, which is Tylee's biological dad. So what does her husband do? Well, he helps Lori and builds a hair salon onto their home so she can continue to stay home with Tylee while being a stylist. Now, we know Chad is an author. In 2003, his books are pulled from desert bookstores due to a scene in a book he wrote called Chasing Paradise, where a warrior angel drop kicks a naughty spirit through the wall. Why would you pull that? Like, if a good spirit kicks a bad spirit, that's kind of like, yay, right? Guess not. So in March of 2004, what does Chad and Tammy, his wife, do? They start publish a publishing company called Spring Creek Books. 2004, Lori is kind of making some rounds. Not only is she on Wheel of Fortune where she wins $17,500. By the way, I have that episode on my YouTube. I need to pull it up and tweet it out. The same year, Lori is in the Miss Texas pageant, Mrs. MRS, because she's married. She makes it to the semifinals, but not the final round. So in August of 2004, Joe Ryan files for divorce from Lori, and that began probably the nastiest custody battle I've ever read about or heard about that lasted until he was found dead in 2018. At the time of the divorce, they lived in a home worth over $700,000. Joe spent over $75,000 fighting for Tylee. Basic visitation rights, holding Lori accountable when she wasn't living up to the court order, things like that. I mean, she fought him at every turn, y'all. I highly encourage when you have time to go back and listen to the custody battle episodes, it will blow your mind. And Tylee's guardian, Ad Lightum, gave a lot of insight into what all the professionals were thinking during that time. I'll give you a spoiler alert. Lori was full of it, and she was using Tylee as a pawn. All right, March 2005, Lori files for bankruptcy. She claims to have almost $724,000 in debt. 99000 of that was owed for taxes. She listed her credit card debt as $17,000 and says between 2003 and 2005, she only made $41,000. She claimed she needed at least $74,000 a year to care for Colby and Tylee. And at this point, Joe was paying her $1,500 a month in child support. Back then, that's a lot of money. Lots of money for, for one child because here's the thing. According to Tom Ware, who I talked to and Fruit Loop talked to over the phone for hours at separate times, Joe never formally adopted Colby, even though Colby took Joe's last name. Reason being just a spoiler, Lori accuses Joe Ryan of sexually molesting not only Tylee, but Colby. The Guardian ad litem said they never were given access to Colby to question him about the accusations. So if he were formally adopted by Joe, they would have to give access. He never saw anything to indicate it was more than a name change. So Lori moves to a property that costs $1,900 a month, and that divorce was final in May of 2005. 
So I think it's important. And the reason I'm doing the backstory before tomorrow, we really get into Lori and Chad interacting from the very beginning. There's a pattern here with Lori. And I think it's very important to understand how she operates as a mother, as a person. And so that's why today we're kind of doing a little bit of backstory. Not all, believe me, we would be here for days if I dove back into that series. So on February 24th, 2006, Lori marries husband number four, Charles Vallow. He would be victim number one in Lori and Chad's and Alex's alleged killing spree, which was on July 11th, 2019. We're going to get into that murder later. So August of 2006, Lori claims that Joe Ryan molested not only Tylee, but also Colby. Tylee is put through invasive exams, as you could imagine, when there is molestation on the table as an accusation. I will say this, the custody battle was so in depth and you can listen to the connecting the dots series to get the a breakdown of the hundreds of pages in this court order. She defied court order after court order. The court did not hold her feet to the fire. It, it, it'll make you sick y'all to read how she used Tylee as a pawn. So, Regarding those molestation accusations, August 5th of 2007, Lori's brother, Alex Cox, let's pull up Alex Cox's picture. What does he do? Well, they had an arrangement, Lori and Joe, that since things were tense in the divorce, that they would exchange Tylee at a place called the Kid Exchange, which is protected. It's a safe place for, for parents to drop their kids off so the kid is not exposed to nastiness that couples that can't get their crap together and do what's best for their kids have to actually pay to drop their kid off at these places just to make sure it's safe for everybody involved. After Joe does the exchange with Lori at the kid exchange, Joe signs out and walks to the parking lot. But Alex rises from the picnic table under a tree and approaches Joe wearing a baseball cap, sunglasses, a dark shirt, a vest, and dark pants. Jo Alex says, do you remember me? Joe says, no, who are you? Alex says, you don't remember me. I'm Alex. Joe says, what do you want? Alex says, we need to talk. At this point, Alex is approaching Joe. Joe says something nearby to be something to a person nearby that he needs a witness to this. He had the, the smarts enough to know this isn't going to be good. The person says, okay, what's wrong? And then Joe says, Alex Cox is my ex-wife's brother. Alex says, we're going to talk right now. Joe says, we have nothing to talk about. Alex says, yes, we do. And this is for what you did to my nephew. At this point, Alex reaches into his vest or pants and pulls out what, at the time, Joe thought was a gun. Alec lunges towards Joe and tries to push what he sees now is a taser into Joe's chest. So Joe turns to the left side of his body, and that taser deploys, which, hit, which hits under or just left of the shoulder blade. He said his arms raised up, and he felt burning and intense muscle spasms. Joe starts to run away. So what does Alex do? tases him in the back with a forceful push, which caused Joe to fall. He hit the ground with his right hand, breaking the fall. Then he rolls to the left to prevent Alex jumping on him as he's on the ground. Joe gets up and runs across the parking lot to the main entrance of the kid exchange building with Alex just steps behind him saying, I'm going to kill you. Alex is telling Joe, I'm going to kill you from what Joe heard. As he's running towards the main entrance, a second witness was leaving that building and yelled from 40, 50 feet away for the second witness to call 911. So Joe yelled, please call 911. Joe yelled, this is Alex Cox. He's trying to kill me. Joe was very smart in identifying his perpetrator and asking for witnesses. So it's interesting to note that Joe called it years ago, telling police he is afraid of what they might do to his house or to him again, and that his entire family, Alex and Lori's entire family, 
have been causing him problems. And Lori stated she would rather have death for him to have another visit with Tylee. Joe told authorities he was afraid that could mean anything killing herself, Tylee, or him. He knew way before these murders, Lori was a danger to that child. Ultimately, Joe is injured. He fractures his wrist. He hurts his back, which I believe caused him problems to the day he died. And in the end, Alex is charged in December of 2007 for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon causing serious bodily injury. So March 31st of 2008, Alex pleads guilty and serves 90 days in jail. But while he's in jail, he writes a friend asking her to call his mother to find Joe Ryan, asking her, the friend, to have his mom write down Joe's address and license plate on a postcard. In June, he writes again to the same friend. The world, quote, the world is coming undone. The pedophile is unpunished and I'm in jail. I guess it's time for the apocalypse. Can you get a picture from Lori of one of her ex-husbands and send it to me? Some of the guys would like to hang out with him. But in July of 2008, Alex is released from jail and he actually jokes about the tasing incident in a stand-up routine. He was a wannabe stand-up artist and said something about, you know, when you try to do the right thing and you, you think you're going to get a medal, but you get a felony. And it wasn't funny at all. And and now it's time for a word for our sponsor of the week, Lomi by Pila. Look, I've never been able to compost before. It's always too complicated, too much work, and it's too stinky. Then I got a Lomi. Lomi allows me to turn my food scraps into dirt with the push of a button. It's a countertop electric composter that turns scraps into dirt in under four hours. There's no smell when it runs, and it's really quiet. Thanks to Lomi, I have way less garbage each week, down from four bags to two, by the way, and I feel great knowing I'm composting and creating soil instead of waste. I have basically a limitless supply of dirt for my garden. So what can you put in Lomi? Food leftovers, fruits and vegetables, eggs and eggshells, grains, coffee grounds, yard trimmings, house plants, and more. If you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just make cleanup after dinner that much easier, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash what the world and use the promo code what the world to get your $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash what the world and use promo code what the world at checkout. Food waste is gross. Let Lomi save you a cold trip out to the garbage can. In 2008, that same year, Chad and his wife, Tammy, filed for bankruptcy. The same year, Melanie graduates from the Air Force and marries that little cutie, Brandon Boudreaux. He's remarried now to a beautiful woman. Uh, but that same year, when she graduates from the Air Force, they get married. He comes in much later in a very big way. In 2009, interestingly enough, Lori is found in contempt of court on seven charges related to custody issues. But guess what? How much time does she serve? Zero. Because she's always one up on the legal system. In 2010, Chad and Tammy's bankruptcy is over and they have $203,000 in debts forgiven. In 2011, Lori establishes her iCloud account, which will come into play later after the children go missing. Kind of moving ahead, when investigators began pouring through that account, they saw nothing but a normal family with photos of celebrations, birthdays, marriages. They said, yeah, there were problems in the marriage, obviously, but it was very typical of married couples and nothing that would indicate any kind of abuse by Charles. Lori was due in 2011 to have a psychiatric exam that was court ordered, but she called and said her sister had a baby who had medical complications in another state and she couldn't make it. She asked that evaluation be rescheduled in October, but a psychologist caused, uh, called and scheduled it for August 1st of 2011, saying that Lori is a flight risk. And so Lori attends the evaluation on that August date. There were several psychiatric exams that Lori successfully beat. One of those being when it hit the fan with Charles and he asked she be examined. 
All that's coming up. September 11th. This always cracks me up, y'all. And I know it's bad, but, <clears throat> you know, Chad can go to the other side. So he said Tammy's deceased grandmother visited him and told him, Tammy needs to stop playing the online game Frontierville and get back to genealogy and temple work. What does Chad do? Types up the message and gives it to Tammy and her parents. Okay, Tammy's a grown woman. She don't need her mommy and daddy telling her what to do. But, I mean, honestly, if deceased grandma's coming through, I don't think it's going to be about Farmville, right? I mean, come on. We were all up in that game. I got up at like 2 a.m. to plant my carrots. I'm going to admit it. December 2011, Alex completes his probation on those charges related to the tasing with Joe, and all charges are dismissed, and he is allowed to carry a gun again. May 25th, 2012, little J.J. Vallow is born. He was a preemie and a little dude. He only weighed 2 pounds and 14 ounces. So how is he related in this family? J.J. luckily was an in-family adoption. Kay and Larry Woodcock are his grandparents, okay? These beautiful people right here that I have grown to love. And so JJ was born addicted to, or two parents who had addiction issues. And he was in NICU for quite a while, as you know, being two pounds and 14 ounces. And Kay took very good care of him in NICU and brought him home. But that makes JJ technically Charles's great nephew. But Charles wanted to keep JJ in the family, wanted to love him, wanted to be a father. So he and Lori ended up and adopted JJ a little bit down the road. So also in May, Chad began publishing non-Mormon doctrine stories. 2013, Lori and Charles begin the adoption paperwork for JJ. He goes to live with them when he is around nine months old. So sometime in 2014, Chad meets Julie Rowe on the a Voice of Warning message board. Now, for those of you who don't know what a Voice of Warning is, it is a group of like-minded people who think the end times are coming. They do all the prepping and, and that kind of thing. And it's based around religion, but I don't know that I call it LDS. I'm not one of these people who is going to sit here and bash any religion except for the religion of Chad Daybell, because it's all hogwash, right? Hop in my portal. We'll go travel. Why ain't he portaled out of that cell yet? Questions I want to know. But Chad published her book, Julie Rose book, around 2004, and it was about near-death near experiences that she had. And Julie became close with Chad and Tammy and was a regular visitor in their home in Rexburg for around three years. Julie said when they started working together, they talked on the phone almost daily and they would talk about and compare their visions and what they saw happen in the future. I said this on STS, but these people needed to be like Stevie Nicks and keep their visions to themselves, y'all. Because, yeah. She said Chad had once told her about an out-of-body experience he had. He said, quote, his spirit came out of his body. His kids were there. His wife was there to witness it. <laughs> And it was complete, he was completely out, outside of his body in his house for a few minutes, and then he got back in. After that experience, I started to notice some changes in him. He started talking to me about past lives. There were witnesses to it, according to Chad, and he was, y'all, okay, I'm going to tell you right now, Chad's obsessed with Harry Potter. I have figured this out because he said he felt like Harry Potter back when Tammy was alive and he felt like, you know, the Harry Potter's under the stairs and all that. He's ruined it for me, y'all. I'm going to tell you right now. Um, but I think some of the things that he's written about is very Harry Potter. And you ain't no Dumbledore, dude. You a dumble dumb. Uh, so in, after that experience, you know, she noticed something changed in him. So on June 12th, 2014, in an email to Joe Ryan, at this point, Lori is married to Charles. Lori says they are moving to Hawaii after Charles got a job there. She said she would be gone. Her and Tyler would be gone from Arizona by August 1st, 2014. And she wanted to talk about how to handle that move regarding Tylee. This surprises me. I don't know that Lori really wanted Tylee to go because there were two options from Lori. Number one, for Tylee to move to Hawaii and visit Joe 
or Tylee stay in Arizona with Joe and come visit them in Hawaii. She certainly at that point wasn't fighting for Tylee to be with her 24-7. Tylee was, I believe, in high school at this point, and maybe they were having their issues, I, I you know, but that surprised me that she gave Joe the option of having Tylee. Joe responded that Charles should move to Hawaii and Lori and Tylee stay in Texas and visit with Charles. I believe at that time, Joe Ryan was in Texas. Eventually, he moves to Arizona to be closer to Tylee, and that's where he died. He told her he did not agree to the move, and she would need a court order, which is very standard when uh, a parent is going to move out of state. July 25th, 2014, JJ is officially adopted by Charles and Lori. August of 2014, Chad's mom rents a cabin in Island Park, Idaho for a family get-together, and Chad said he was at a gas station in St. Anthony, of all places. It's about 15 minutes from Rexburg, where they ended up and settled. And as he's filling his van with gas, he looked south over the valley, and a voice says, You will live here soon. And after the vacation, Chad went to the temple in Provo to get confirmation. He said he did, but he was left in dark about the timing. So at the end of 2014 to the beginning of 2015, Charles, Lori, Tylee, JJ, and Colby moved to Kauai. Lori was obsessed with Hawaii, clearly. She got married there several times. December 8th, 2014, Charles and Lori register a mobile juice bar called Juice Island Hawaii LLC. Lori worked at the church Get this, y'all, as a youth leader. She met April Raymond, who had also been divorced, and they bonded over the fact that they were divorced. They had been divorced. April told Dateline, after all this came to light, Lori was really fun to be around. She was positive. She was full of energy, full of life, and she enveloped her and April's boys very quickly into her life. So you love bomb. Lori's a love bomber. She makes you feel so good about yourself that you can't help but not but want to be around her. That's a very manipulative tactic to me. Another friend who anonymously spoke to Justin Lum from Fox 10 Phoenix, Nate Eaton, Justin Lum, have been the OGs on this case. If you don't follow them across social media, please do. They taught us so much in those early days when only they really knew what was up. But another friend told Justin Lum she was 100% into the end times, meaning Lori, the end of the world. And she would tell me, nah, you got to start preparing for the end of the world. You got to start getting your stuff together. She would order stuff all the time. And she would tell me all these books she needed to read, including trying to give one of Chad's to her. Lori would say things to me like, I'm never getting divorced again. I'm on my fourth husband. And then she would tell me, you got to get rid of your husband. We'll just go off and do our own thing. She also told this woman, as she told several other people, including Annie Cushing, who is the niece of Tylee, I mean, the aunt of Tylee and the sister of Joe Ryan, it's going to be the end of the world and we should all just drive off a cliff and kill us and our kids and die at the same time. I'm going to tell you what, I ain't never had a thought close to that. If anything like that happened, it would be because I'm a moron and I was distracted and went off the cliff. I mean, you see early on, her thoughts were just already kind of focusing in on this doomsday thing. Another friend who wanted to remain anonymous told Justin Lum from Fox 10 Phoenix, she watched as Lori became obsessed with Chad's books. So February of 2015, Chad has another vision about moving to Rexburg. He said, I was walking down a path and I came to a fork in the path. As I looked down the right fork, I saw in the distance a glorious city with a temple in the center of it. A voice said, moving to Rexburg will be a tremendous blessing to your children and your grandchildren. Look, dude, if you're hearing voices, check in somewhere. I mean, serious. I ain't never heard no voices talk to me. I glanced down the left fork and sensed it represented us not moving away. And that path was filled with many lost opportunities. After this vision, I reread my children's patriarchal blessings and each one verified what I had seen. I was still waiting for the right time, even to mention it to my family, though. A couple of weeks later, we were eating dinner. Following the dinner, the words slipped out of my mouth. When we moved to Rexburg... 
that he said Tammy was not thrilled. And I completely understood her feelings. Moving to Idaho would be a major undertaking that would uproot, uproot the both of them from their families. He tried not to bring it up again, but after a few weeks, she also felt impressed by the spirit that it was something they should do. She started looking at real estate websites and one house in particular jumped out at the both of them. And there was a second home that also seemed like it could be a good match for them and their family. So they drove up to Rexburg in late March of 2015. They went house hunting in Rexburg and after a few duds, they found what they were looking for. Now, I have found Chad's old blog, and all of that is on the Connecting the Dots series. Every entry is read. You can just see his descent into madness. But on Chad's blog, it was a lot like our home in Springville, except it also had four acres of pasture and a pond. The home needed new carpet and fresh paint, but as I walked through the pasture and discussed the house with my son, Garth, we both really felt this was the place for us. And his son, Garth, said, I feel I could really thrive here. Tammy and the other children agreed, and from that point on, everything came together quickly. They closed on that house in early June of 2015. So Chad began writing his novel. Let's just make clear, Chad made $2,000 a year as an author. If you look at the older pictures, he's like in some random person's living room with like his, his khakis pulled up way high and then he has like a plaid shirt checked in in his buzzed hair it's so easy to see the glow up if you could call it that post Lori, where he's got like the fade haircut and he's wearing way too tight skinny jeans that you'd see on some 40 something year old dude in a bar trying to look cool really that's that's what it um what it looked like to me so Lori told melanie given 2019 it was during those years right there of 2014 and 2015 that Tylee had turned into a zombie. So in 2014, 2015, she's already pegging Tylee as a zombie. Probably what she's seeing is a typical teenager who has a mom that's really super weird and probably doesn't want a lot to do with the lady or is just a typical teenager and fights shit every turn sometimes. At some point in 2015, Colby decides to move back to Arizona from Hawaii to do his own thing. July of 2015, Chad launches his blog, cdaybell.com, and he posts a lot of stupid stuff. I'm not even going to get into it. Now, on body cam footage from 2019, when Charles is very worried about Lori for the first time, he tells officers that Lori became obsessed with her new religious beliefs around 2015 to 2016. September 24th, 2016, Lori posts a happy birthday message to Tylee on Instagram. Happy birthday to my little girl who is all grown up. Your mommy loves you so much. And there was a bunch of heart emojis. And then on December 28th, 2016, one of the mobile juice bars started by Lori and Charles is dissolved by Lori. And the other two are dissolved in 2018. So late December 2016, early 2017, Lori, Charles, Tylee, and JJ moved back from Hawaii to Arizona. Also, in early 2017, Lori and her brother begin listening to these podcasts. It's like preparing a people. It's got Melanie Gibb, who's going to come in later. It's got uh, Julie Rowe, who believes in past lives and that kind of thing, and started eating it up. On an episode of Dateline, Lori's friend from Hawaii, April Raymond, who I think is adorable, says she noticed a change in Lori and Charles's relationship. April said she thought Lori felt su superior religiously to Charles and that he was not on her level spiritually. April said Lori wanted a partner who was on her level spiritually. That could be where this all kind of starts because it really starts getting heavy that next year in 2018 towards the end. 2017, Chad and Melanie Gibb meet in Ogden, Utah. Melanie Gibb was co-host on podcasts with Lori and her boyfriend slash husband at the time, or whatever, David Warwick, Jason Mao, who's somebody who's kind of loosely related. I've never dove into his story, so I'm not going to cover him too hard on here. But uh, Chad and Melanie Gibb Mel met in Ogden, Utah, where Chad was giving a speech about his visions and his dreams. 
July 11th, 2017, two years to the day that Charles Vallow would be murdered at the hands of Alex Cox with the direction of Lori and Chad, I assume, allegedly. They are inquiring about a school in Arizona for JJ. It was an amazing school. It is for kids with various degrees of need. And I hate to say disability. It's a word that I, I don't like. Every one of these kids have abilities. But it's a school that caters to kids that have different physical and um, and mental challenges. And schools like that just help kids to thrive so hard. Helps them to find new ways to communicate so December 17th, 2017 through February 2018, Charles makes arrangements for JJ to have a service dog. So when JJ gets Bailey, the golden doodle, he slept through the night for the first time in a very long time. And this was beneficial because JJ had a tendency to wander off and he may go outside. So Bailey would alert Charles or Lori if he did. During this time, um, Colby gets married to Kelsey See in January of 2018. Colby said at this point, everything was normal and everyone was happy. Colby told Justin Lum from Fox 10 that Charles and Lori would have normal arguments, but overall had a good relationship most of the time. Colby also told Dateline that when he married his wife, it became a competition with Lori and Keith Morrison asked him if she treated him more like a boyfriend than a son. And Colby said 100%. That is weird. January of 2018, Colby told Chandler police that this was around the time he started noticing that Lori and Alex, her brother, started hanging out more and got close very fast. We know they're starting to listen to these offshoot podcasts, the Band of Misfit podcast. And in February of 2018, Melanie Gibb becomes Zulema's visiting teacher. So that is a... LDS thing. So somebody explained it to me. I did not pull that back up. I couldn't find it actually. It's been three years since, since I said, it's been a while since I started this, but um, that's how Melanie Gibbs Zulema eventually Lori comes in the picture. April 3rd, 2018. Unfortunately, Joe Ryan is found dead in his apartment. The death is ruled as natural. He had been deceased for some time. And was only found when a neighbor noticed the smell coming from his apartment. Now, Joe was cremated. They collected samples from his liver, thigh muscle, and kept those for toxicology testing. His death was revisited after the kids went missing. But again, it was ruled as natural. Here's what's crazy. Lori was still listed as his next of kin and was told 10 days later of his death. Lori did not notify his sister Annie or anyone in Joe's family of his death. It wasn't until a background check was done on Joe and they notified his brother. Annie Cushing, his sister, told KSL TV she learned about it five weeks later. An obituary posted by the Arizona Republic said, if you have information regarding this person, please call Legacy Funeral Home. That is sad. I know that Joe and his siblings were put in foster care as kids. And so, but they did reconnect some as adults. And I'm really glad they did because, um, you know, she did get to meet Tylee a few times and, and, and see her. Lori told a family member after Joe's death that he was evil and God took care of him. She admitted to someone that she did get a life insurance payout from his death and said she was going to share it with Tylee. Yeah, right. Authorities released photos of Joe's apartment after his death. Each picture, y'all, on the shelves had Tylee in them. There was a double deadbolt on the door. I think he was afraid. I think he was afraid of Alex. I think he was afraid of Lori because of what had happened with the tasing. He had workout equipment and a blood pressure cuff was seen. He had struggled with some weight gain and depression in his later days as anybody would. I will put those pictures up tomorrow of some of these things we've been through today. It looked like he had been cooking shortly before his death and his apartment was bare. It was basic necessities, although you did see a few little things in there for Tylee. There were lady sunglasses on the bathroom counter, and I've always wondered, were those lorries? Even though it was deemed natural, I have never ruled out somehow they were involved. 
There was also a living sober book on the floor and the power of now a guide to spiritual enlightenment book. He was trying y'all. May of 2018, Lori invites Joe's sister and Tylee's aunt, Annie Cushing, to visit Tylee. She has an amazing website called Analytics. She has a very comprehensive breakdown of the timeline in this case, and I recommend you go visit it. During this visit, Annie had Lori pegged just like her brother did. She talked to KSL TV and said that after the visit, Annie texted her daughter, quote, it was absolutely exhausting. I dealt with so many lies, even with little things. I think Lori's unhinged and untethered from truth. And Lolo was crazy. I saw a dark side of her when I was there that makes me question some of her claims. And I regret going down there. She may be a sociopath and way more. That what, that's what makes me feel Lori was a sociopath. To her, this was all a game. She had no empathy for the suffering anyone else was experiencing, including Tylee. Annie also noticed the relationship between Tylee and Lori was very tense. She also felt Tylee was being discouraged from mourning the loss of her father, Joe. Annie also saw Lori obsessing about the end time, saying, it's like she wanted me to be afraid of the end times. There was one time she was talking about it, and she says, sometimes I think it would be better to put my kids in a car and go off the side of a cliff. Boom. Just again to somebody. I would never say that in joking. This unfortunately was the last time Annie saw Tylee. September 2018, Chad begins a podcast called Glimpses Through the Veil. And throughout that year of 2018, Chad was attending conferences and giving talks about his books, meeting people, pushing his his product. September 21st, 2018, Lori meets Jason Mao in the celestial room of the temple. He wants her to meet Melanie Gibb. He was somebody I think that was doing these preparing of people conferences. I know a lot of people feel like he was more involved. I honestly have not went down that rabbit hole, but I haven't seen really anything that makes me think he was involved in the offshoot, like in a deep way or the murders. But if you guys know different, please leave a comment. I'm often wrong. So September 23rd, 2018, according to Melody, Melanie Gibb, this is the date Lori and Chad meet for the first time. September 24th, 2018, Tylee turned 16. This would be her last birthday. She would be dead by her next birthday. October of 2018, Melanie Gibb meets Lori and later introduces Zulema to Lori and Chad at a preparing a people event in Utah. There was some discrepancy there of whether that first meeting was the one or the next meeting was the real meeting. But in October of 2018, so it begins, Chad starts emailing Lori and it is like a little baby snowball going down a hill that gets bigger and bigger. And we're going to pick it back up tomorrow. Tomorrow is the, the meat of the beginning of the end for so many innocent souls at the hands of Chad, Lori, and Alex, allegedly. So I wanted to do this kind of backstory to give a little context of how things started with Lori and Chad with this doomsday obsession. Seems like podcasts and crazy books. Look, y'all, podcasts, we're not all that way, right? Um, I'm trying to see if I missed any pictures. We got the Wheel of Fortune and the flow chart. Everybody in this photo grayed out is dead. That is one, two, three, four, five, six people, including Joe Ryan. Lord have mercy, y'all. We got trial next month. Y'all are not going to believe what's coming up in these next few days. If you are clueless to this case, buckle up. Get you like something to drink, sit back and chill because... It's a lot to digest, and we're going to learn how Kay and Larry Woodcock made those first calls saying, we have not seen our grandson in a while. We're worried. We need you to check that set off. Where are the kids? So we're going to get into the meat of it tomorrow. So join me again. Thanks for tuning in. Share this with your friends who you think want to follow this trial. I will be bringing daily updates every single day of this trial on this podcast. You won't miss a minute. 
and we're going to do this together, y'all. This is the trial that stole my heart with these missing kids and launched this podcast, and we are going to go full circle and finish this out. So I can't wait to be on the ground in Utah, get to see Nate Eaton, who I met in Vegas at Crime Con, Scott Reich, who I met in Crime Con. Uh, Lori Hellis will be there. Just uh, I'm hoping Lauren and Dr. John come up. And just a lot of people who are very passionate about justice in this case. So you guys are going to have a good crew up there. And uh, I encourage everybody to tune into all their stuff because true crime is no competition. It's a collaboration. If you're doing it for the right reasons, we all have something different to bring to the table. We all present it in a unique way. We all see and interpret it differently. And there's a lot of good groups out there that are producers, podcasters, content creators, and I think you guys are going to get a very good picture of what happens up there. In the meantime, your girl's going to get this uploaded, go to bed, and start again in the morning. I got to weed through 898 pages from that mega series to pull the best parts. But we're going to do it, y'all. Have a good night.